Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Priya Hassan from Maulana Azad National Urdu University, Hyderabad, India. Welcome to our course and welcome to the first lecture of this course, which is on astronomical data. As you know, this course is basically centered around astronomical data, where we are going to basically show to you how we use archival astronomical data to do various projects and study astronomy in much depth. So astronomical data is the center of what we're talking about. Now, what you see in this image over here, it's an image of a globe where you actually have constellations marked over here. And these position of the constellations, they actually point down to a date of about 125 BC, which actually matches to the catalog made by the Greek astronomer Hipparchus. And Hipparchus was pronounced the earliest to catalog data about stars, their positions, their brightness in a very systematic manner. And that's exactly what we call astronomical data. If you observe the sky and catalog or get your data recorded in some form, which can be organized and used. What is the present terms and types of this data that we have today? Most of the data that we have today is digital data. Even data which was got earlier as photographic plates has been digitized. We'll talk about it in a bit. And often the data could be either in-depth study of individual objects in the sense of what we call targeted observations, or they could be survey data of a larger or probably even complete sky. And these data sets have a very large amount of data that they're handling. So for example, the ESO VISTA survey, it handles about 150 terabytes of data per year. The LSST telescope, or the Vera U. Rubin telescope, it would do about 500 terabytes per month. Okay. You also have data which is from simulations. For example, the simulations we talk about that later, TNG 300, 300. This is giving you more than a few petabytes of data. This is the 2018 release. And therefore, since you have such large data sets, these data sets need to be housed in data centers, which basically house all the data from these data sets, since they are so very large. And it's not just one data center, you could have many mirrored data centers, which actually mirror also the same data so that users can access it from various sources. The data can be also handled using programming, for example, with Jupyter Notebooks, so you one can actually write code to access the data and actually manipulate the data and get it in a certain format as per your requirement using Jupyter Notebooks. We won't be talking about Jupyter Notebooks today, but we have some separate sessions specifically for Python where we'll be starting right from the basics and taking you up to a level at which we can access, actually access astronomical data with Jupyter Notebooks. Now, what is the kind of data which we're talking about? The data could be just images. From images, you can create catalogs. That is, you actually look for objects in your images and make catalogs out of them. You could actually have individual spectra of objects. You could have polarization data. You could also have what is called time series data. Time series data is, for example, you have a variable source and you measure the brightness of the variable source with a certain time uh, cadence or whatever time step. And that could give you what is called a time series data. Now, uh, what is the, for example, let's come to the first kind, which is the most basic kind, which is an image. We're talking now about digital images. So if you talk about digital images, what are they? It's basically a two dimensional array across X and Y. And you have some pixel value, okay? And the pixel value is actually giving you the brightness at this certain point, okay? Such an image would essentially be a black and white image where you actually just have counts at, this, at different points on your XY grid. Now you can use such an image to actually create what are called RGB images or color images. In astronomy, we often use what are called artificial colors also. You may give colors to an object depending on their wavelength or their energy. So for example, you may put your more high energy objects as bluer, your lower energy objects as redder. And you may hence artificially create an image uh, of the object which you're actually looking at. Now, what are the kind of objects you'd actually look at? You could either be looking at point sources or extended sources. A point sources, for example, galaxies, and an extended source for, sorry, a star, for example, or extended sources, for example, a galaxy. Now, what is the basic paradigm shift which came into imaging in astronomy actually came with the event of the CCDs. The CCDs are what we call charge couple devices. And uh, they were basically invented in 1974. And you have a picture here of Boyle and Smith. These are the inventors of the charge couple device at Bell Labs. And this is what has got a major paradigm shift in the understanding of astronomy imaging uh, since those times. Now, what is the basic advantage of CCDs? 
CCDs have a basic advantage, the most important being what is called the sensitivity or what we call the quantum efficiency. So you can look at the quantum efficiency. It's basically telling you how many photons which fall on the CCD actually get detected by the CCD, right? How many of them get detected? So for example, if you take your eye, right? And you have say 100 photons, you may actually detect just one, right? But for example, if you have a photomultiplier tube, you're improving it. And as you go on to CCDs, you're actually achieving about 80% or more than that. That is your 80% of the 100 of the photons which actually fall on it are actually detected by your CCD. And that's what's called the sensitivity or the quantum efficiency. And that's very crucial, especially in astronomy, because the sources you are looking at could be faint sources. And therefore, every photon you get from that source is precious. Right? You would like to detect every photon that comes. The other thing is your dynamic range. That is the brightness of objects that you can actually see how faint and how bright. This can also be changed by basically because with your CCDs, you can change your exposure times, how long you're going to observe your object. Based on that, you, for example, if you have a very bright object, you do not observe it for too long, otherwise your CCD will get saturated. But for the fainter objects, you need to have a longer exposure. And hence, accordingly, by accordingly adjusting it, you can adjust the, the range of the objects that you actually look at. The other very important part about CCDs is its linearity. By linearity, what you basically mean is you look at this plot over here, is that supposing you have an input versus an output. As your input increases, your output increases, and this goes linearly. So for example, if I were to use my CCD to observe, say, for one hour and get, say, 5,000 photons, if I observe for two hours and I get 10,000, this is linearly increasing in terms of the, the, the output signal. And therefore, I can integrate for a long time. So for example, if I want to observe an object for 10 hours, I can do that as long as I keep on adding on. You can see over here that after a certain stage, you can have something called non-linearity. That is after some time, you could have your pixels saturating. And so then if you, if you even increase your exposure time or the input, even if you increase the input, the output does not increase proportionately, right? And therefore, in this case, but for these both two points, it would be very difficult for the observer to say, how has the number of output photons giving you the correct amount of input photons? Because for the same amount of output photons, you have, same, uh, you have two different input photons, right? So what you basically want to do is in the linear regime of the CCD, you want to detect so that you can use the addition of frames or the addition of photons to actually get your signal to much better efficiency. And therefore, you can actually do this with CCDs, right? For example, with our eyes, we cannot do that. We, we, we just have a certain period in which we detect it and we cannot add on, right? Uh, in this case, we can actually add on, which was there even with photo. Uh, with photography, only disadvantage being saturation happened much earlier. And therefore, you would already reach the non-linear regime once the photographic plate starts getting saturated, right? While in this case, you have a much larger linear regime. And as long as you work within the linear regime of the CCD, you are going to get a good data set, right? And uh, so this is the way you're actually getting digital, digitized data, digital data because you are digitally detecting it. Digitized data means that, for example, if you had photographic plates, you can use that to actually digitize it, but you know that your digital, your uh, photographic plate itself is a nonlinear detector. And hence, by digitizing it, you are, uh, you know, you do have some errors which are coming in because you are not necessarily in the linear regime of your detector. Now, uh, how do we actually get colors in our images? So what Eastman Colors, you know, Kodak, the company Kodak did to actually get colored photographs was to use something called a Bayer filter. So what a Bayer filter did is that basically you have a square grid of photo sensors, right? And these photo sensors are sensitive in different wavelength regimes, right? So for example, the green one is more sensitive for green, the red for red, blue for blue. So what you actually did is you had a grid of these green and blue sensors on it. And this is what is basically used even today in digital cameras, in camcorders, in video shooting, etc., where you actually use this to actually get your RGB image because different, uh, different parts of the pixel are activated by different uh, by photons which activate the blue, red, or the green region. And using this, you actually get a colored image. 
So this is how we get the basic color images, which we use for all our digital photography, cameras, videos, etc. Even the video that you're looking at just now. But in astronomy, we do not do this. In astronomy, we do a slightly different approach. You know that the, the signal, the, the input signal is not going to change much with time. And therefore, what we do is we actually use filters in succession. So when you're actually getting your image, which is your basic black and white brightness image, you actually put a filter in front of it and get some kind of readings, which you have for the filter in the beginning, say with the blue filter, you then do it with the weed filter, and then you do it with the third filter, we say the R filter. And using that, you will actually get three different images of the object, right? And then we use these three different images to overlay them, we will do that in future, to actually create what are called RGB images. So in that, what you do is you exactly overlay objects and you place them. So for example, on the left, you can see, this is an image of Vestalin 2, which is a, a star cluster. And you can actually see this has been observed by a two meter telescope. And uh, what they did is they overlaid different uh, filtered images. While over here, what you see on the right is this is a Hubble image. In a Hubble image, they basically also overlay, but they also use artificial colors. So you can see here, these are regions which are dusty regions, but to enhance the dustiness, you actually put artificial colors to actually show these different parts. And using this, you would know which is the part which has the hotter gas or the cooler gas, etc. depending on how you characterize the colors of your image, right? So here we have an example of artificial colors being used to create an image. Now in astronomy, we actually use a certain uh, thing for images. We use a certain format, which is called the FITS format. You may be familiar with formats like the JPEG or the, uh, you know, the, the other uh, formats which we use for a GIF image, right? But those kind of images actually lose out important data, which is required in astronomy, right? And therefore in astronomy, we use this FITS, which is the Flexible Image Transport System data, which is actually a system which is used to store data. It puts it as a 2D image. It can also put it in the form of a table. It also has extra information, which is called a header file, a header file has different information about the image itself. For example, it tells you which telescope observed it, uh, on what date, and for how long was the exposure, with what filter times. So it's kind of packaged with the image. So with the image, you also have packaged along it information about the image. Like I said, the filter, the exposure time, the telescope, etc. It's all put it along with it. And it's basically used to actually store this data. The data can be also, you could even have spectra in this format, you can have data cubes, and you can have various kinds of data which are put into this FITS format. Another important thing for astronomical data is the brightness. When you actually look at the brightness of objects, when you display, right, when you display an image, what you see on the left, this first image over here, is you can see an image which where the scaling, the brightness levels of a monitor would be 2 past 16, which is about this, or 65,000 counts would give you the brightness. If you were to actually just scale an image based on the counts, you would get an image something like this, which would get displayed like this, which, is, which does not convey so much. So therefore in astronomy, we actually play around with image displays. We try to see how can we display our image in a much more effective and a much more uh, you know, beautiful manner, which actually shows out. So for example, here I've shown an image which actually rescales the original image such that now you're scaling it such that you're only taking counts from 4,572 4, to 6,002. So this image basically has counts up to about 6,002. So you don't want to, uh, so you just, you rescale your image. So you can rescale it linearly over here. And then there are other techniques of scaling it, which is square scaling, which we have over here. So I'm gonna show you some display software, which is actually used to display astronomical images and what we basically do is we rescale the brightness of images to enhance the properties of the image, right? Otherwise, if we were to just take it on counts, we would get things like this. But we actually use uh, some techniques to actually enhance the display of images. Now here you have an image, very nice image of NGC 281. And you can see how nice colorful this image looks. But it's not that this image actually has purple stars, right? These are not purple stars or blue stars, whatever you think. 
And a lot of this image is basically made up of artificial colors. But what we do is we have these artificial colored images and we overlay it with other images. So for example, this image is basically a, a, an overlay of two images. One is an image which we have from the telescope called Spitzer, which actually observes in the infrared. So if you look at this part, this whole part is from the Spitzer image, which you can see this thing over here, these pillars and this jutting out part over here, which you can see over here, which is from the Spitzer image. What we do is we basically rescale it to actually give it certain, uh, you know, enhancements or depending upon the kind of brightness we are getting. So this is in a certain filter in a 3.6 micrometer filter of Spitzer. This basically shows you this image. Now the same image was also observed with Chandra, which is an X-ray telescope. And what you see the big square over here is the footmark of the Chandra exposure. So if you can actually see over here, when Chandra observed it, it basically is an X-ray telescope. So it's looking at very hot stars. And therefore the artificial color, which was applied to the Chandra image was blue or violet because it's basically showing you very hot regions, very high energy photons. And this is NGC 281 by Chandra. Here we had it by Spitzer and here you can see it by this. So what has to be done is very, very carefully you overlay two images so that they lie exactly one on each other with the right scaling, with the right angles, etc., so that they actually sit. And what does this tell you? This basically shows you that in this region, which are the sources, which are X-ray sources, which are the infrared sources, and where exactly does this gas and dust lie around over here? So it basically helps you to see the interplay between the gas and the dust and the hot stars, right? So by using this kind of overlay of different images in different wavelengths, in different energies, we can actually use this to unravel the physics of this region to actually see what's happening to these stars, which are the ones which are emitting and which wavelengths and what is contributing to what in this image, right? The other kind of data you could have, like I mentioned earlier, is what is called spectral data. What is spectral data? Spectral data basically means is that you are actually checking what is the energy distribution by a certain source of light in different wavelengths. So for example, if this is the range of wavelengths, you are seeing which one is brighter, which one is fainter. So you can see these are absorption lines and therefore here these are black lines and you are seeing which wavelength you have these black lines at. So this is telling you how does the intensity vary with the wavelength? Where are these dips coming? So it tells you that this source of light, whichever you had, it's giving you some absorption at some particular wavelengths. Now, once you measure the wavelengths accurately, you can actually identify which is the element which is going to give you this kind of absorption at those wavelengths, which can contribute to creating a spectra of this kind, right? And therefore, that's how your spectra are created by basically getting this. So what is a spectrum? It's basically a one-dimensional data because it's basically telling you how does the source vary in its brightness at different wavelengths, right? Now, what happens is in today's telescopes, we also have what is called, uh, you have what is called integral field spectroscope. That is, for example, you can actually get the field, the spectrum for every pixel on the object, right? So what you're actually going to get is each, each pixel actually has a spectrum received from the, uh, has the spectrum. So for example, if this is a galaxy, you're looking at a galaxy nucleus, you can actually look at it like this in the sense if I take this pixel, if I look into it in depth in terms of the cube, it's gonna tell me how much is it emitting in blue light and green light and red light. So I'm going to get a complete, in this way, I'm gonna get a distribution in terms of wavelengths. If I cut it as a slice, it's gonna tell me how does this nucleus behave in a particular wavelength. For example, if I have the Balmer line of hydrogen, I can take a slice in the Balmer line and see in the Balmer line what's emitting. So I can see in the galactic nucleus, what is it which is giving me the hydrogen spectrum, right? So I can take slices, which would be like this, which would give me the distribution in XY for a particular wavelength, or I can take a pencil, you know, a, 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 I can poke a, a pencil into this, which will actually tell me for this particular pixel, what is the distribution of light in different wavelengths for that given pixel, okay? And now this data is generally stacked up into what are called data cubes, because you can understand that if you were to actually keep it in terms of separate files, it would be very confusing, very difficult to handle. And hence this is kept in the form of a fixed file, which is a data cube, 
So the FITS file has a header file which actually tells you what is the object you're observing with, using which telescope, what exposure times, what filters, etc. And then you have a data cube, which is actually slices of these, which are all stacked up together. So then, for example, if you want to look at it in a particular wavelength, you can look for the slice which carries, which carries the red data or the blue data or whatever wavelength you are looking at. So data is also kept in the form of these data cubes, right? So it's a three-dimensional data set. It is X, Y, and the pixel and the spectrum per pixel. Now, why do we need things like this? For example, if you're looking like a, at a galaxy, like this galaxy over here, supposing you have the spectrum for different points in this galaxy, you can look at over here. I can use the spectrum to actually get velocities, right? So for example, I get velocities for different points along this galaxy, at the center, at, this, at the middle, at the edges, etc. What can I use that for? I can use that here, for example, in this case, to actually get the rotation of a galaxy. So what you see over here is I have a galaxy, and you can see that here you have the lines which are actually getting redshifted because they're going away from us. Spectral lines, the ones coming towards us are getting blue shifted. You can see that the edges are coming to us at a faster velocity than the central part. Similarly, this edge is also going away from us at a faster velocity than this, right? So this is the way you can actually measure rotations of gal galaxies if you have an integral field spectra of those galaxies. The other kind of data you can have is what is called catalog data. So for example, catalog data is basically tables. So you have tables. For example, here I have a table for clusters. So there's a cluster name. These are the coordinates, the right ascension, the declination, galactic longitude, galactic latitude, uh, the radius for the 50 stars in it, number of stars, the proper motions, etc. So these are like, uh, you know, these are like spreadsheets, they are catalogs, but in astronomy, we handle that far better using something called TopCat. And TopCat is the thing which is used to handle tabular data. We're going to have a separate session on TopCat from the base, from the writer of TopCat, the person who actually did TopCat, is called Mark Taylor, and he'd be telling you about that on the 22nd of August. So that's when we handle catalog data better, the, cat, the top cat, this thing. You could also have time series data. For example, I have a source and you can see that every day that if this is the days, every day the brightness is changing. And therefore this could be in a tabulated form, which basically tells you how is the brightness changing on various days, right? So you may put it in the form of the Y of T, which is over here. So that's your time series data. We will also be talking about various tools which are used for visualization of this data. For example, the simplest tool, which I will show you all soon, will be the image visualization tool, which is called DS9. Uh, there's also a tool for catalogs, like I told you, it's called TopCat. And there are programming tools. For example, essentially what is used in today's times are Python. And uh, we're going to have special sessions on Python, which will basically show you the modules, the libraries, etc., and how to use Python for astronomy data. And uh, all these have to not be used as black boxes, right? They are useful tools, but you need to understand your tool very well so that you can effectively use your tool to get some amount of data or understanding of the data that you have. Uh, along with the data, you also have what is called metadata. There's always, like I said, in the FITS file, there's descriptive information about the data, which gives you information like what are the telescopes, the exposure times, various things about the data, and that is what is called metadata. So metadata is data which kind of supplements data, which gives you data about the data. It tells you how was the data got and what is special about the data, right? Now, what is an astronomy archive? We saw already had a look as to what is the kind of astronomy data you could have. You could have images, spectra, catalogs, time series, polarization data. But what is an astronomy archive? When you actually look at the sky and you put the data in the form of an organized systematic form, that's what we'd call an astronomy archive. And like I mentioned today, that there are already archives which are many terabytes and petabytes inside. There's a very large amount of data which is already available to our benefit, which is there, uh, which is very good quality data because a lot of this data is from space telescopes. Some of them are from very large ground based telescopes. And these are very good quality data. It's not that it's leftover data from which there's nothing. It's instead very useful data because it's very high quality data. And there's, there's still much more potential in that data of the kind of science you can get from this data. 
Now, like I mentioned earlier, the earliest archives we have is of Hipparchus, where Hipparchus actually tried to tabulate, but Hipparchus, the catalog was a very small catalog, just 850 stars, which were uh, kept in magnitude scales. We'll talk about magnitude scales tomorrow. That is a scale in which we describe the brightness of objects from magnitudes one to six. And uh, he actually set up that scale. What you see on the left of here, you see Tycho Brahe. He was a very talented uh, observer and uh, he actually uh, very well tabulated the position of naked eye planets as a function of time. And uh, one of the first examples of use of archival data was the data used by Tycho Brahe, which was used by Kepler. Now Kepler actually used Tycho Brahe's uh, data to actually study planetary motion. You know, these were the times when people were still arguing about whether we had a geocentric system or a heliocentric system. And uh, the basis of that would have been the observations of planets. So if you actually observe planets, see how they are moving, you can actually decipher what kind of orbits they have to understand the structure of the solar system. And that's exactly what Kepler did, that he actually used his data, Tycho Brahe's data, to actually dis decipher the movement of planets in the solar system. On the basis of which he set up what was called the three laws of planetary motion, which are Kepler's laws of planetary motion, but they're all based on the data which was got from Tycho Brahe. Because as we always know in the scientific method, what we actually use is you have to have observations which comply with the theory. If they do not comply with the theory, the theory needs to be changed so that it adjusts with the observations. And once you get contradictory observations, the theory has to go hand in hand with the observations, right? So uh, later on, people continued the system of making star catalogs. So in 1603, Bayer made a catalog, laboring every star in a constellation by its brightness. So what he did is he identified constellations. The brightest star, he called it alpha. The next one, he called it beta. Then he called it gamma. So in that way, for every constellation, he named alpha, beta, gamma, etc., and named every star in the constellation. In 1771, Charles Messier actually made a catalog of nebulous objects. And basically what he was doing is he was basically looking at cometary kind of objects. So these were fuzzy objects. Some of them actually turned out to be fuzzy objects in the sense of nebulae, etc. While some of them, with better telescopes, if you looked at them, you could actually resolve them to be galaxies or star clusters, globular clusters, etc. But that gave Messier catalog, which is about 100 objects. The Messier catalog is still used by people to actually look for deep sky objects. And then you had the NGC catalog, the Drea catalog, and all these are examples of organized data where you actually observe the sky, you organize what you observe in a category, you know, in a systematic way, which can be actually used. Now we're going to jump in time. And one of the earliest sky surveys where people actually try to study the whole sky was done by Palomar. In Mount Palomar, you have a telescope. And what they basically did is that they actually used these photographic plates, which you can see over here, which have a size of about 14 inches square, right? And uh, using 2000 photographic plates, they actually covered the entire sky, okay? So each plate would cover 36 square degrees of sky. And using that, they actually got plates which would cover the whole sky, observations of the whole sky. This obviously covered the northern sky. Similarly, sky surveys were even done for the southern sky. And uh, these were in the form of photographic plates. So what you can see over here, you have this instrument where you're actually looking at the plates, okay? And uh, later on in the 1990s, what people did is they actually digitized it. That is, you actually looked at the, the plates and put them in the form of a digital form. So now if you actually Google it and you actually Google DPOS, you'll actually get the digitized Palomar survey, which will actually give you the digital form of those same photographic plates. So that's how it actually started by with Palomar, they started doing this digitization. And, uh, and then you're already 50s, 60s, 90s. And then when you see in the last 30 years, 40 years, there has been a real difference in the kind of technology which we are dealing with. Now we are actually accessing digital data, right? So I already spoke to you about CCDs, charge coupled devices, which are shown over here. A small CCD chip over here is shown to you over here. Like I said, these have a excellent quantum efficiency as well as a linear response. And therefore what you basically had is in the DPOS survey, you actually had photographic plates which were then further digitized. But here you are getting first hand digital data using CCDs. 
And uh, that's how you actually started getting CCD images. You also had a big change in the technology. So you can see the technology in terms of uh, computing technology. It, it improved much more. You can actually see how uh, computing power has increased with time from electromechanical to, to vacuum tubes, transistors, integrated circuits. We've actually moved on to very high speeds of computation. And you know, even the phone you hold in your hand has a, such a good computing power that it can actually compute a very large number of things. And using this, we actually have what are called citizen science projects. That means even citizens can actually access data. Oh yeah, I, and I need to mention the internet. The internet is one of the greatest boons that we have of modern times. And um, that's how people can access all this data, which is available, talk to each other and do things. And um, that's exactly what enables us to do this school, this course also, which we have over here. And that's thanks to the internet. And the internet has actually brought in that kind of a democracy in science, where now data is available to everybody. Wherever you are sitting, you have access to libraries, you have access to information, you have access to data, you have access to anything that you would want, right? As long as you know what you're looking for and you know how to apply the knowledge that you have. Now, this essential change happened uh, in CCDs, basically in optical and infrared. And then CCDs were also applied on to using into, for example, X-ray telescopes. So you had a sudden boom where people could actually then observe in other wavelengths also, which include the radio wavelengths, the X-ray wavelengths. So you have all these things happening together in the last 30, 40 years that people are observing the sky in an organized way, in a digital format, ranging from X-ray to radio, which includes optical, near infrared, etc., various wavelengths as well as with very high computing power, as well as good internets, internet speeds. And uh, so you see technology goes hand in hand with this amount of data that now that has been collected with astronomy telescopes. You also have very high technology. You have computing power, which is shown over here. You have the internet, you have, uh, you know, you can use the internet from your laptop, your phone, your tablets, etc., desktops. And as well as a very large amount of storage capacity. We have very large storage capacities to store data. And uh, that's how now there's such a big boom in astronomy archives. And this is really very nice because this is the true spirit of, spirit of science because data is available to everyone. <coughs> Except if, for example, if you observe with a certain telescope, if you have written a proposal to observe with it, you may have a certain proprietary period. That is a period when the data is purely yours. But after a certain period, which is often something like 18 months, the data gets available to everybody, right? Instrument groups, they have more access to data in the beginning while they are still trying to, you know, calibrate their instruments. And uh, hence, because of that, we have various citizen science projects. That is, even citizens, non-scientists also can do a certain amount of scientific data. So you can even Google and look for the SETI project, which is the search for, search for extraterrestrial life where people can actually log in and offer their computing power to actually help analyze SETI data. There's also the Galaxy Zoo, which is a very large uh, citizen science project where, where a lot of citizens are actually sitting and classifying galaxies and their morphology because basically the data size is so, so large that astronomers cannot be doing it. So anyone who offers their time and their effort can actually sit and analyze the data and uh, categorize galaxies as per their morphological types. And um, so I will pause over here and uh, we'll talk about the data archives in the next section. Thank you.